Hi folks, welcome back to the series on IT fundamentals. In this video, you will learn about an important function of operating system, the file management system. So far we have discussed about various types of memories like CPU register, cache memory, RAM, a type of primary memory, secondary memory. We also discuss about read only memory, the ROM, which is another type of primary memory. ROM has embedded software in it called firmware. We also discuss about the process of booting when the computer is powered on. To begin with, the processor would send the hard bits to the BIOS. BIOS is a firmware which would then wake up the peripherals and load the operating system into the RAM. An application is loaded in RAM as a process. We then discuss about the memory structure of a process in detail. When the CPU wants to load a data or instruction in the register, it would first search in the cache. If not found, then would go to RAM. When there are too many processes opened by the user, then the operating system divides them into pages and loads few of the pages in RAM, leaving rest of them on the secondary memory. We discuss the mechanism of virtual memory management through the page table mapping. Now let us discuss about the secondary memory. The hard disk drive has multiple rotating magnetic disks and a read-write header for them. The disks are further divided in tracks. A highlights here a track. The tracks are further divided into pie-shaped structure, geometric sector. An intersection of geometric section and a track is a track sector. On magnifying and simplifying the tracks, one can clearly understand how every track sector, independent of whether it is outermost or the innermost, it can store exactly same amount of data. Traditionally, it used to be 512 bytes in one sector. Later, under advanced format, it was changed to 4096 bytes. Now the question is, how to prevent overwriting of one application data by the other applications? Let's understand. When an application tries to save some data on the hard disk, the addresses of these track sectors cannot be exposed to the applications for the data security reasons. So, the operating system allows the data storage on the secondary memory through file management system API. A file is made up of small chunk of memory units called blocks. A block is a group of track sectors also called as cluster or on Microsoft operating systems it is called allocation unit. I will be using all of these terms alternatively. You must have seen this screen while formatting your USB drive asking for setting the size of allocation unit. We will discuss about how to select the value in the later part of this tutorial. Now let us understand how a file is organized on the secondary memory. To begin with, I have a puzzle for you. There are two English words hidden somewhere in the grid. Can you find them out? Let me give you some hints. The first word starts from the second row and second column and it is three characters long. And the second word starts from the third row and third column and it is five characters long. Now it is easy, isn't it? On the similar lines, the operating system maintains a file allocation table FAT on the secondary storage. This table provides a map of the clusters or blocks that a file can be stored in. When a new file, say file1.txt is created with size equals to two blocks, then the OS will try to find the first continuous available memory blocks and will allocate them to this file. In this case, it is block number 200. Every block maintains information about the next block in the chain. Since here the next block is the last block, it points to the end of file block, which typically contains the value equal to minus one. In the same way, file2.txt is also stored. Note that the only starting address of the first block for every file is maintained in the file allocation table. A free space bitmap is also maintained separately that indicates which blocks are used and which are free. One indicates free and zero indicates already allocated block. For example, block number two, three, four, five and nine are free and rest of the blocks are allocated here. Now let us assume that the file1.txt is deleted by the user. So the entry is deleted from the file allocation table and the index table will also be updated indicating these blocks as available for allocation. Next, let's create a new file, file3.txt. 
which is with size 3 blocks. Now the OS does not find any continuous memory block for allocation since the memory is fragmented. So it would allocate the blocks which might be scattered but internally linked. Now tell me what happens if the file allocation table is erased? Do you recall the Hindi movie Ghazni or Hollywood movie Memento where the main actor writes everything on his body because he suffers from the short term memory loss? That text on this body is like this file allocation table. And what happens when the bad guy erases this file allocation table? Obviously all the data would become unaccessible for the users and the data without this meta information is a garbage. And that's exactly what many viruses do. Even when we format our USB drives and select a quick format option, it simply deletes the entries from these two tables, thus quickly making all of the addresses available. So you might be curious about is there any way to recover the deleted files when it is not the case of deformatting? And the answer is yes we can using recovery tools. Interestingly the files also have some header information in the first block. The recovery softwares use this header information to recreate the file allocation table even when the entries are not present provided they are not overwritten with the new file data by then. In deep formatting apart from deleting the entries from the tables OS also stores a special value in place of data. The deep formatting process would scan for the bad sectors too. A bad sector is a disk sector that is permanently damaged. When a bad sector is found it is marked and then the operating system skips it in all the future read write operation. When we keep on deleting and adding new files on the secondary memory after a while it becomes fragmented. The fragmentation makes the read write speed slower since a single file is scattered at many locations. The defragmentation is the process of compacting the fragmented blocks making continuous memory available for next files. This helps in improvising the performance of the system. One more factor that is important for read write performance is the block size. If you want to use secondary memory mainly for storing big files for example storing movie files primarily then the big block size is recommended. This is because the multimedia files are large files and the smaller block size will lead to a lot of read write operation overhead meaning extra work in linking them. On the other hand the bigger blocks when used for smaller files would waste unused memory in a block. This is because a single block is not used for storing information of two files. The memory in the remaining unused block is wasted. That means one has to balance between the file size on the hard disk and the performance. By the way file allocation table file system and the complete series was designed for small disk and simple directory structures. Every storage device has a principal directory known as root directory. All the other files and directories are stored within the root directory. The directories can be nested. Nesting can take place to any depth. These directories are data structures holding following information about each file and subfolder inside. Now tell me when we double click a file to open on the Windows OS how does OS know which application it should open to execute the file? For example when a .txt file is double clicked then it is opened with the notepad application and when a .mp3 file is double clicked it is open with an audio player. Find out and post in comments. Now let us have a look at the end to end process flow of a file write operation when the file is to be saved on an external USB hard disk. Starting from an application GUI when we hit a save button it goes to the application code. Sample python and java code may look like this. They may further call their own language library functions. For example java application will call jvm library. These libraries would then call operating systems file management API through native call functions. The OS would check if the user and the process has the required permission to access and write on the given file. 
then internally the file API will translate the call to their appropriate file system specific calls. Now the drivers will translate this to the hardware level command. In this case, since the external hard disk is connected through USB, hence two layers of drivers will be required. Finally, the data is returned to a particular track via read write head. Now here is something interesting that happens in the background. Since the time to move the head of disk to the correct track on the disk is the slowest part of the complete flow discussed so far, it is important that file system uses efficient disk scheduling algorithms. The read write head might have a queue of read write requests from multiple applications. So it has to make a strategy. First come first serve is fair but has horrible performance. So the scan disk scheduling algorithm is most commonly used. It works in a similar way as an elevator because the head moves back and forth serving read and write requests as it moves. This also explains why contiguous memory blocks allocation result in faster read write operation as compared to the fragmented where file data is scattered over various tracks causing delay in seeking those blocks for the read write head. One more interesting provision. In order to increase the efficiency, memory buffers are used at various layers. Let's understand this with an example. If you are supposed to transfer water from one container to the other using a mug, then it will cost too much of to and fro travel between the two containers. Instead, if you use a bucket and fill it first and then pour the bucket to the second container, that would minimize the travel, thus increasing the performance. Meaning the data is grouped first in chunks and then pass on to the next layer. If the buffer is not yet full, still if you want to flush the accumulated water to the storage, then the programming languages have provision of functions like fflush in C. Let us summarize the new terminologies and concepts learnt in this tutorial. <laughs>